welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Daniel Tobin, a poet and Emerson College professor who is driven by a metaphysical hunger and a deep desire for justice. Daniel's work balances compassion with intellectual rigor and contemporary knowledge with ancient wisdom. His poems are darkly beautiful and consistently explore the many facets of experience, or as Daniel might say, our double life. Daniel holds a Master of Theological Studies from Harvard University and a Master of Fine Arts from Warren Wilson College. He has published five books of poems, and his verse has appeared in Poetry, The Nation, and The Harvard Review, among others. His many awards and honors include a Guggenheim, the Robert Penn Warren Award, the Robert Frost Fellowship, the Discovery of the Nation Award, and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. Daniel's most recent book, Belated Heavens won the 2011 Massachusetts Book Award, and Daniel is with me here today to talk about that book, his writing, and his journey as a poet. Daniel, welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's great to be here. Would you start by reading a poem? I'd love to. <clears throat> I'm going to read the poem called Westwood. It's a local poem. Yes, you think, it's hard to be homeless even in the interval between homes. The one you left behind a thousand miles where your wife remains unweaving rooms into boxes piled with destinations, bedroom, den, and the home that waits you picture like a new Ithaca, its welcome barred by land courts, capricious gods. Of course, you tell yourself it won't be long, 20 days perhaps instead of 20 years. Still, it's hard returning nights from the job to this house generously loaned by a friend under contract itself, stripped nearly bare but for your bags and the one remaining bed and the spindrift left of her parents' lives. No, it's not easy to walk among remnants of a lost world even when it's not your own. The antiseptic walker, the bag of shoes, shelves of kitsch, a jeweler's scale, decanters. Blunt inlays where the furniture would rest, bearing up beneath the warm, familiar weight, like casts of the rug's unalterable burden. And on every wall, an empty, faded patch, unbandaged skin, where the pictures came down. Whatever wound you harbor with passing time seems less and less like Odysseus's scar, that genre piece his nurse knew from childhood and more and more like the raging whirlpool he pilots toward, whichever way he tacks. Though maybe it's better not to see the journey as some insistent metaphor that surfaces in lives that would otherwise be their own instead of masks for the one-storied life. Better to see the name on this suburban town as an exit sign off the interstate from which you will move on without trial and not an allegory of your last end, anyone's, or gulfs stretching between stars. Now euphony wings through the barren halls. Pick up the phone. Your beloved is calling. Mm. I love that ending, and I love the poem, because it's something everyone has experienced at some point, but it's also such a great example of your work, because that poem is about a journey, and in some ways, it's about the double life that we all have. Yes. Um, I see it as a kind of interleaving between, obviously, events that inform my own experience, but it, I think it translates into and out of that sort of life of Odysseus, sort of the, uh, the idealized life of the journeyman, the, 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 the person who moves through life and travels in a kind of uh, unexpected and potentially endless journey until he finally gets home. And I think the poem really entertains the notion of what is home and, and mm -hmm. the idea of that, you know, really at some level we're all homeless. Uh, we, we, we aspire toward home. Home is an advent in some mm -hmm. ways. It's not something mm -hmm. that we have with us. It's something that we aspire to, especially when one moves beyond childhood into one's own life as an adult. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, the topic of home is something that I think strikes people in a very deep way. 
But one of the things that I love about that poem is that it shows your ability to inhabit the present and yet also bring to life some of the great literature and the ancient writing that has spoken to humans for so many years. What does that familiarity with the, with the great writing do for you? How does it shape your perspective? Well, the challenge, I think, is, is to make it available. I want to make myself available uh, to you know, enlarge one's mind, enlarge one's soul, by entering those worlds that have so informed our world over great, all of history and many, many cultures. So I think the challenge to a poet is not to uh, allow those stories to inform the work in a hackneyed way, in a way that's simply pro forma, as it were. The challenge is to allow um, <clears throat> our circumstances at this particular moment in history to be informed by those past lives, as it were, and to uh, let our lives add up to something more than uh, the mere circumstances of our lives. And so I think the poem is, is is playing with that idea a little bit, kind of walking the edge between the notion of a single life being merely emblematic as a kind of generic symbol of, of something, and recognizing that every life is completely unique and unrepeatable and individual. And the poem wants to sort of make its way through those two impulses. Mm -hmm. And I think the poem does that beautifully. Thanks. You have taken a journey as a poet, and also you have taken a spiritual journey. And I want to hear about both of those adventures. But start by telling me about how you really came to write poetry and how you decided that this was going to be a life path for you. So it was odd. I mean, I, my, my own family was not much informed by books, I have to say. There were not a lot of books in the house. There was one. Uh, anthology in the house that I did pick up and read. How it got in the house, I have no idea. My parents never seemed to pick it up. It seemed to be just there. And I browsed around the classics, the great poems. Um, so my own background in terms of poetry and literature wasn't tremendously informed early on. But um, I did have a curiosity, have a curiosity and also um, around the age of Oh, 14 or 15, I got up one morning and I had the strangest notion that I wanted to be a poet. Uh, I have no idea where that came from. It's sort of unprecedented. And, and of course, I think a lot of people start being engaged with poetry, maybe around that age, maybe a little bit younger. And the challenge then is to uh, make it something more than a hobby, that, that you, you, you are intrigued by it. But for me, it never left. Uh, I just in a very deep way, I wanted to be a poet at the age of 14 and 15. I have to tell you, I had no idea what that meant whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of literature in the house, as I said. And so the path forward from that has been you know, somewhat circuitous, uh, but I've managed to find my way a bit. Mm -hmm. But there was something about poetry that spoke to you on a very deep level and that continues to speak to you. So when you think back on that decision at the age of 14 or 15, looking through the lens of an adult, what stands out to you now? I think I was looking for poetry as a, as, as a way of obtaining emotional and intellectual access mm -hmm. to matters that uh, were of ultimate human importance, mm -hmm. that they were informed by my religious background. I, I grew up Catholic, uh, pretty strongly Catholic, uh, still am Catholic. but. Uh, merely remaining within the religion didn't seem to be entirely enough. I wanted to personalize it in some way, and I think the quest that seems to be involved in the poetry found a way of steering through that path um, simply by through the, through the language and the, the rhythms of the language that I felt pretty deeply at an early age, especially people mm -hmm. like Wordsworth and Keats, the, the great romantic poets who I love. Mm -hmm. Now, you hinted at the fact that you have taken a spiritual journey in addition to your journey as a poet. When you think back on that and the way that spirituality and poetry now converge, what were some of the key moments 
in your spiritual journey? Key moments in my spiritual journey. Well, obviously, growing up, I grew up in uh, a house that was deeply informed by Catholicism. When we said goodnight to our parents, we would say, Sacred Heart, bless. Mm. And so the iconography of religion was really all around me and imprinted mm. itself on my mind and on my psyche. So just being in that milieu and growing up in, a, you know, I went to Catholic schools all the way up through college, this was fairly uh, <laughs> extensive exposure, <laughs> so to speak. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, uh, you know, Joyce's Stephen Dedalus is completely informed by this, and I, I kind of feel great resonance with that kind of background. At the same time, I think there's a somewhat a reverence streak in me, too, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a good kind of way. Um, so I, I'd say that when I moved into, into um, you know, uh, my, my teens, I think the, the lure of poetry was also a way to transgress a little bit. Uh, I was interested in the language. I was interested in lots of different kinds of poetry. I went to, as you pointed out, Harvard Divinity School, and the desire for poetry never left mm -hmm. me there. And uh, in fact, as I proceeded up and through my my doctorate as well, I, I, I did a course in religion and literature. So literature and religion have always been linked for me. Mm. They seem to be completely enmeshed in um, my way of uh, living in the world. Um, and I, I think that there's some common ground between me and other poets in that way, though not all poets seem to be drawn to religious questions, as mm. I, I clearly am. Ne there's never has, I've never actually felt uh, a part from asking and in trying to inhabit religious questions, even though I'm obviously not uh, you know, a, a religious myself, I'm not a priest or so forth, but it just informs the ultimate questions of who we are. Mm -hmm. Why is there injustice? Um, how, do you, how do you engage with that? How mm -hmm. do you um, bring a larger perspective to bear on the one life? I mean, I quoted uh, Whitman to you, in uh, one of our exchanges, and it's from uh, starting from Palmanac, and the line is simply "death, death, 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 death." Well, that's that's where you start from. You know, life. You start from life, but you also start from death. Life is profligate; it's all over the place, right? Grows and blooms, so forth, in beautiful ways and less attractive ways. But death is also profligate because that's going to end. And when you when you when you face those two things, and I had a pretty early awareness of that in my life. Mm. Um, I think that has been the spur to poetry all the way through. Mm -hmm. How does a poem begin for you? How does a poem begin? It begins really with an idea sometimes. It's not exclusively that I have an idea about something I want to pursue, something intrigues me. Some of the poems in this book were actually uh, prodded, so to speak, by uh, little blurbs in the Metro uh, paper on my way to work, so I looked at this. Oh, that's interesting. You know, turtles swimming in the mm -hmm. in the uh, in the in the Pacific find, can find their way by scent. That struck me as an interesting thing. I jotted that down, mm -hmm. and I knew that I was going to write a poem on that someday. I didn't know exactly when it would happen, and it did mm -hmm. eventually. The other thing that has to happen for me is once I start hearing the language, I start hearing a line, particularly what I think is a first line. Um, the poem doesn't seem to really start moving until I hear a cadence, a rhythm. Mm. And when that starts to kick in, I seem to be able to move a bit more uh, briskly through the drafting process. I do multiple drafts and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. Most, I think most poets, unless they're really lucky. Like Keats wrote the Ode to Autumn, I think, in about 45 minutes, apparently. Lucky mm. him. Uh, most of us have to draft a few times, <laughs> more than, or more than a few times. The other thing I would say is I think my, my inclination as a poet is structural. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a strong structural sense. I have a sense, not always, but um, Pretty, pretty early on where a poem it needs to go, if not in an absolute sense, then in a pretty strong sense. Mm -hmm. Now you have a poem that beautifully illustrates <coughs> all of that. Would you read it for us? Sure. Um, this poem was, uh, this is poem is called Prayer. And this was in a sense thrown down as a, a challenge by Billy Collins and then to myself. Billy Collins invented a highly repetitive form called a paradel. And it was meant to be a kind of parody of highly repetitive forms. And so when you read Billy Collins' first paradel, it's, it's quite funny. There's a bunch of articles strung together. It, it doesn't make sense, right? But I thought, well, that would be interesting. 
um, to try and write a parallel that actually did make sense, that actually took serious the, seriously the, uh, the form that, that he had invented. And what that is, it works sort of like this. Well, it works like this. Um, there are four stanzas, and um, the first two lines in each stanza repeat exactly. The second two lines repeat exactly, and the last two lines of the stanza use only the words in the first four lines and no other words. You do that two other times, right? And then in the last stanza, you, the last stanza is composed only of the words you've used previously in the poem and no other words. So it's, it's kind of like a weird Rubik's cube. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Prayer. There is something to be praised in repetition. There is something to be praised in repetition. For surely all life moves in seasons. For surely all life moves in seasons. Praised surely for all there is, seasons, life, moves in repetition to be something. Still desire for rest whispers in the body. Still desire for rest whispers in the body, like the hint of a lost name or a nagging song, like the hint of a lost name or a nagging song. Rest desires a name for the song, a hint, nagging, lost, like a still body in whispers. Let me wait a novice on nothing's threshold. Let me wait a novice on nothing's threshold until the blown seed lifts on its diamond fulcrum. Until the blown seed lifts on its diamond fulcrum. Novice, blown fulcrum, let me lift on nothing until its threshold awaits the diamond seed. Something waits for the body in whispers. Diamond hint in seasons of repetition or surely it lifts on a still fulcrum. Let me rest its novice, like all nagging life, until desire moves, blown seed, nothing's name. There it is, threshold, lost song to be praised. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful example of how the form and the, the meaning of the poem are so intricately connected. And as I was listening, I felt what you meant. I didn't just hear it, I felt it. And the form is one of the reasons why the poem works so well. Yeah, I think ideally the form is a conveyor of the whole meaning of the poem and in a way, in a deeper way, the whole being of the poem. Mm -hmm. The poem has its own life beyond the poet, obviously, and should, like any work of art. But the form of the poem has to be something that uh, conveys the full impact of not only the poem, poet's emotion, which it could, but the poet's emotion is the poet's emotion. And the, <clears throat> the emotion that the poem conveys has to be larger than that. It's, mm -hmm. it's a way of giving birth <laughs> in a kind of strange way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that poem, um, it just occurred to me, it actually that was written fairly quickly, remarkably enough, but you know I'm, I'm repeating so many words it has to be you know, fairly quickly done if you can find the way of mm -hmm. ma maneuvering them. Um, it's, it's, it's a kind of highly ritualized language and poetry I think generally speaking, if it's good and from my point of view, is, always has a kind of ritual about it. Even when you cut a line, when you're cutting a line, you're creating verticality in the language. Language ceases to be merely horizontal. A novel, theoretically, right? You mm -hmm. could run that across a ticker tape. There's no cut. As soon as you cut a line, you're intentionally shifting the language and creating a dimension of verticality to it, which is inherently, from my point of view, uh, a dimension, not, o not only the imminence of what language is trying to represent, but of the transcendence towards which it aspires. Mm -hmm. Mm. Beautifully stated. Now, earlier you talked about injustice. How does that relate to poetry? Well, it's a challenge how, how it relates to poetry. Auden said poetry makes nothing happen, and that's a very famous statement about poetry. Um, but I think poetry needs to provide concentration 
on the part of, uh, you know, uh, part of the language to bear on spiritual strength, perhaps. Not that it's going to tell you how to live or how to endure something, but it's going to hopefully, ideally, poetry provides that kind of concentration. Mm -hmm. We have, there are political poets who speak out against inju injustice, like famous Turkish poet Nazim Hikmet, for example, mm -hmm. uh, who was thrown in jail for many, many years. And there are, of course, great many examples in many, many cultures. But poetry has to have a life beyond uh, the program, so to speak, the, the, the whatever might be considered propagandistic about what the message is. It's got to go deeper, I think, than simply a political agenda of whatever kind. It doesn't matter. So I think the effect of poetry has to be much deeper than whatever the message is politically, even if there is deep injustice involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, Wallace Stevens said in The Necessary Angel that it's a violence within that tries to push back against the violence without. That mm -hmm. violence within is the positive violence of, of the spirit soul asserting itself against that kind of injustice, which is it's, it's just there in the world. It never leaves us, and it never will. The poor will always be with you, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. Now, at the beginning of your last answer, you mentioned the word concentration. Mm -hmm. And poets do need to concentrate, and they need to be deeply involved in the contemplative life. But your other life is that of professor at Emerson College. Yes. Tell us a little bit about how that impacts your writing, especially since you are also handling other duties yes. now. Well, I haven't taught now in a couple of years because I've been interim dean of the School of the Arts at Emerson College. When you teach, um, you're giving a lot to your students, and that takes up a tremendous amount of time. I, hopefully, you're giving a lot to your students, and it takes out a lot of time. But there's something quite, I think, compatible in many ways, teaching and, um, and poetry and trying to make art, the, the, at least for me. Um, Auden again said that you're better off being a carpenter, don't ever be a teacher, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of poets find that compatible. When you're administrating, as I've been doing for the last couple of years, this is a different kind of challenge. Even though I like administrating, I like working with curriculum, I like working with other faculty and this sort of thing, um, it is more um, deeply functionary, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. than, than, than deeply engaged in teaching. Um, so it's a different kind of challenge. You, you have to maintain a core inside yourself. You have to find time, and I desperately seek to find time whenever I can find time, to jot down an idea, say I'm going to give myself a couple of hours here or there to work on a poem. And I've been able to do that in the last couple of years. Not as consistently as I used to be able to do it but I still do it. And I just get very grumpy if I'm not working on something. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think that you, you, if you want to do this, the challenge is to find that habitation in yourself that allows you contemplation. Mm. And then to squirrel away whatever time you have to begin to pay off on that contemplation in the poem. Mm -hmm. Again, beautifully stated. Would you tell us a little bit about the manuscript that you are finishing now? Oh, the one I'm finishing now. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this was a big ambitious thing. I like being ambitious with stuff, uh, with poems. Uh, I am currently um, finished, I'm pretty much finished drafting. I'm going to go back and look some more. But it's a manuscript which is going to be entitled From Nothing. And <clears throat> It's, it's a poem, it's a narrative poem with a lot of lyric elements. It's in 33 sections, or I'm calling them 33 takes. Mm. And it's about the Belgian physicist and Jesuit priest, George Lemaitre. George Lemaitre is largely forgotten. He was a great scientist. He is the first one to fully conceptualize the idea of an expanding universe emerging from a primeval quantum. He called it a primeval atom. But it's the same idea, that the universe is not static, as Einstein himself believed, mm -hmm. but it's rather expanding. And in fact, he, he was such a fine scientist and amazing mathematician, he actually anticipates some of the discoveries of the accelerating universe that apparently exists now. So uh, just a tremendous mental you know, figure. Um, he also lived uh, in Belgium and fought in World War II, rather fought in World War I. 
uh, faced some of the worst kinds of ho horrendous uh, battle in World War I, and also lived and was re a resistor in his own way in Nazi-occupied Belgium. So his life intersects with the most sublime thoughts that human beings have thought, say, in the last hundred years or so, and the worst possible manifestation of human evil. And mm -hmm. that attracted me um, deeply. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that manuscript sounds as though it's going to be another great example of how you balance present day concerns with the past and the intersection of present and past. And the idea of people having two lives is always with you and with us. I think us. it's true. I think mm -hmm. it's true. Yes. We are almost at the end of our show, so would you read that wonderful turtle poem? I will indeed. This is called Small Ode to a Sea Turtle. To travel rolling depths by smell and sniff the wind to find your path, seaweed, beach grass, spindrift of palm, such codes of the invisible further you, mute current plotter, sojourner through muck and rack line, ocean's navigator, parser of waves, tidal swales, old soul. I knew you first in glossy pictures, then fed your image in a tank in that room above the narrows where I first dreamt of a future. Nothing of your voyage compares Though I would, pathetic figure, fashion you a simulacrum of my own bewildering desires. And your port, Ascension Island, climbs from the littoral of words into light bracing as blown surf, the shell of flesh become a raiment. Patience is the art of all you've been. Sensing promise shores, you'll breach into home's trackless air. You'll breach to nest and to begin again. Oh, that is gorgeous. In the remaining seconds that we have, is there anything you would like to say about that poem? That was one of the poems that emerged from my looking at the Metro uh, and finding that little blurb, as I mentioned earlier. And what that tells you is that the prod for a poem, the possibility of a poem, the possibility of art is really all around us. It's all there. It takes uh, being prepared to see it and then working out of that preparedness to make it real. Well, thank you for your insights and for preparing all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm.